Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, so, uh, today we'll uh, have a second set of our lectures. And uh, as I promised to you yesterday, uh, there are going to be two lectures on two topics. One is about formal communications, and the second one about quantum sensing. Uh, quantum communications uh, with single photon and entangled photon state. Um, basically, uh, the second, uh, originally when quantum communications came about, it was mainly about quantum cryptography. That was, would be the subject of today's lecture. However, yesterday I mentioned to you that these days quantum communications is a broader area. What does it mean broader? It's, it's, it's broadened into the issue of distributing quantum states between different nodes of the network. And uh, I will touch it a little bit only tomorrow. But uh, in regards to some interest in latest results of our own, since this is the school, uh, I will I'm mainly talking about the old stuff, just educational things. But at the end, I will spend like a half of the lecture showing you something new that uh, is different from all what you can find in the literature and uh, it's just recent. And one of that is how to direct entangled states in the network. But today I will concentrate on the traditional meaning of quantum communication. It's like secure uh, transmission of information in the form of cryptography. Well, I'll talk about the first implementations in academia and in industry, what has been done. Uh, what you can see today everywhere around, in the literature, in the professional literature, in the semi-professional and non-professional literature. Uh, there are lots of uh, efforts talking about the quantum secure communication. Uh, I would like just to give you an idea of what it is in a nutshell, because lots of people who are talking about this today, very often they're just not very well aware of the real things. Because it just sounds cool to say, okay, we have a quantum secure communication. Um, so it, it doesn't mean that uh, it's really kind of what, what they want to do. And then we'll just talk about the perspectives of the whole area here. We started uh, talking about this yesterday at the public lecture, basically. And maybe just uh, conclude with that. Again, um, quantum cryptography, <clears throat> well, uh, you need to have security. Security of communication between Alice and Bob. And uh, as always, there is a third person in the middle who is the main group. Uh, and uh, she would like to take this information. So, conventional communication, as you know, everywhere goes using classical states. Uh, and Eve can always make a copy of that because it's a classical state. You can make a copy. Uh, and uh, that copy uh, has to be decrypted. So the Alice and Bob, they use some kind of uh, cryptographic encryption uh, to make the job of Eve of decrypting this order. And that's a game that is going on in communications for tens of years, for almost 100 years. Uh, well, it was even in the past, uh, older than that, but in terms of the like uh, modern communications, uh, radio-related communications, that's what, what it is. You, the Alice and Bob try to in invent new type of coding that Alice will have a hard time to decode but uh, Alice has no problem to get a copy of that. And basically the uh, arrival of the quantum uh, changes the paradigm here. Now the kind of emphasis is moved from the uh, how hard to decrypt 
something that you can easily make a copy of into the it's impossible to make a copy of then you don't have anything to decrypt basically so that's the difference in the approaches to quantum cryptography and conventional cryptography and uh, as we already I mentioned to you yesterday so the Vernon cipher is the one time pad and the beauty of this cipher is that it's absolutely unbreakable if you use it only once. Uh, it has been used forever and uh, I mentioned to you uh, about these uh, radio stations that talk in numbers because in principle if you have the uh, set, two sets of random numbers you take the message, you digitize it in any possible way, and then you take every digit and you add random numbers to them. You know, the main rule of randomness is, uh, it's very interesting. I, I learned this myself when I was a student. So basically, if you add random numbers to something, it becomes random. If you take random and subtract something from random, it's still random. You multiply random ones by something or divide it by something, it's still random. And randomness, it's, uh, well, by the way, uh, we, we discussed yesterday the issue of correlated, uncorrelated, uh, the issue of correlation. So random, it means totally uncorrelated. If you try to measure correlation function of the random sequence, it will be flat everywhere. There is no any preferred relationship between anything. It's absolutely random. Okay, uh, so if you do that, um, uh, and uh, then uh, you can send the message either way you want. You can use the radio, you can use like talk numbers, you can publish it in the newspaper, for example. Uh, people use that. So you publish a small, in the advertisement section, a small section with numbers in there. And nobody else except the person who has the second copy of that random set would be able to decipher that. That's it. It doesn't matter how you trans so transmit it. Um, uh, it was very interesting when uh, I came to the US uh, many years ago. I was still on Sunday reading real newspapers, not news on the computers, but the real newspapers. And that was a story in the Washington Post uh, that uh, is, uh, people noticed the, this issue that uh, uh, people talking numbers on the radio on the radio and they were saying that uh, the closer you go to the southern border of the United States the more frequently you hear that it means the drug traffickers use that <laughs> all the time uh, so it was very interesting at that time. Actually, I, I didn't do quantum cryptography yet at that time when I learned that. It was just a few years before. Yeah, you have a question? Yes, yeah, and like, we add the same number for each character, or each character's key is different for one time? Right? Well, you basically, you, you at the end of the day, you can digitize it using binary code and use binary random numbers. Just for each number, each like unit, there is like the zero, 01, zero, 01, but it has to be in a random order. Or you can make another sequence of random numbers, not necessarily zero, 01. You can make any sequence of random numbers, and then you can digitize your uh, message like using numbers, uh, for example, number of letters in the alphabet, first, second, third, and blah, blah, blah. But then when you add the random number, it becomes random. Okay. So, uh, and uh, again, uh, the biggest problem of this is one time. And as I mentioned to you that, uh, uh, of course, the majority of people uh, would like to use that because it's absolutely unbreakable. Uh, by the way, if you use one time pad, you are not concerned about quantum computers at all. Because quantum computers is about the protocols like RSA that are based on the derivatives of prime numbers. So basically the idea is if you have a message and you can, if you can uh, 
undo it and uh, factorize it back and find what prime numbers have been used, then you can dis uh, basically decode it all. And that's what the quantum computer is supposed to do. But it, it's not applicable here, so it's stable against any attack, any uh, quantum computer attack. Yes? Why can only use once? Uh, well, because then you introduce the correlation. Basically, you see, that, that, that's a trick. Uh, if second use... It's easier to decrypt because... Exactly, because, uh, you know, what is a correlation? It's some kind of relationship between what you are using, right? In physics, relationship, it could be like phase of two points, uh, mutual phase or whatever. Here, it's uh, correspondence of the symbol to the particular letter. And if you step, because all the letters uh, in the messages, uh, in, in language, they are correlated. Basically, you know, like each language uses like more this letter, more that letter. But there are big theory in the view exists how to decipher it. And basically, using it second time gives you some hint which one is correlated to what. Which basically, which letter is encoded in there. So, but if, if it's absolute, that's why the sequence should be really, really random, like 99.9% .9 random. But the good news is, uh, if you have a sequence of numbers, there is a mathematical protocol that you can check the random placed by correlation. And uh, in fact, if it's not random enough, you can randomize it more, basically. Okay, uh, so uh, because of uh, this fact that it's absolutely secure when you use one, you have to reveal it from time to time. In the past, again, there were books with printed numbers. Then I told you that those people start to put it on different carriers of information, like magnetic tapes. Uh, if still people remember that. Uh, then uh, floppy drives. Oh, they're flying so nicely, you know. Remember those five-inch floppy drives? And it was, when I came over, I said, oh, look, I bought, bought like several boxes of them. Five years later, I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> I was just flying. <laughs> so then the floppy drive begins from five inch go to, to three inch. And then there were zip drives, then there were CDs, DVDs. They fly better. Huh? CDs fly better. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I was, Actually, yeah, actually, it's a good point. I still have a stack of CDs on the shelf in my office. <laughs> you know, read, write CDs. At that time, they were cool. You can read and write. Uh, they were made multiple times on them, but uh, I'm no use anymore. So, and then Blu-ray DVDs, and uh, this technology was improving because uh, originally, you really, uh, and military people, for example, they used that, and uh, to refill the key, they, they have boxes of those CDs and the military guards will transport it once in a month, in month maybe a week or whatever uh, between different installations and then they use them to stick in the computer, use the program to communicate throw away and then next, 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 next and then you still have to refill and uh, but I mentioned to you also that uh, the technology is not staying uh, idle. Also, they develop in better storage tools, and uh, the 10 terabyte drive can hold a lot of keys today. Which means that the uh, motivation is getting less and less really, <laughs> to refresh the key, but still there because it's flexible. Like, uh, what if you uh, your your disk got compromised, for example, or broken, or whatever? Um, then you need to have a fresh one anyway. So the quantum computer is supposed to cover that. All right, so basically you have to refill this uh, from point A to point B. And that's really what the quantum cryptography is about. It's about the refreshing the random key, period. It's as simple as that. That's all the quantum communication is about. Refresh the random key and then use a one-time pad after that. That's all. Uh, how to ref basically refresh the random key, that's what we'll be talking about. Well, quick, quickly, so the, uh, this is just a regular process of encryption. And uh, as I told you, this is symmetric key 
Uh, so the public, the uh, regular internet encryption classical that we're using, it's non-symmetric. So there is the public key, the private key, and other things. So this one is symmetric, both sides using the same key, uh, and you just encrypt it, transmit, decrypt it, and that's what it is. But you need to have this key. Um, and uh, that's basically what uh, it all boils down to the fact that in the classical eavesdropping, if makes a copy or clone, a clone is a copy, right? So that's what it is, uh, information carrier, and there is information from the copy. So basically, passive monitoring of classical information is possible. Well, you put a bug somewhere on the... Um, fiber line or electric line, and you read this signal all the time. In fact, uh, actually it's, it's, it's another interesting issue that you have to be aware of quantum cryptography. cryptography. Quantum cryptography always protects only communication line from Alice to Bob. It doesn't protect the computers that the final and initial information is stored on. And you know that these days uh, the electromagnetic surveillance is pretty powerful. Some of the people, they can uh, read the keystrokes on the computer keyboard from like next room, for example, using the electromagnetic signals. Or sometimes even what computer signals from inside the computer box. So you do the quantum cryptography between Alice and Bob absolutely secure. You store that and someone from next room just still so that makes it not very useful. Anyway, I have to remember about that. Uh, the quantum is different in the fact that Eve cannot clone the information and she does know the state of the carrier of information. That's the biggest distinction of classical versus quantum and that's what really makes the uh, original idea so interesting and attractive for practical purposes to use non-clonability of quantum states uh, for preventing Eve from making exact copy and keeping this copy for the future in order to decipher the message. Well, it's all based on no cloning theorem. There are formal, there is a formal description of that uh, by Wooder, Zurich, and Dix. Uh, so, uh, so basically, you cannot make a copy of an unknown quantum state. So that's uh, one of the rules of quantum mechanics. And I'll, we'll talk about this on the next slide. So as a result, it makes quantum cryptography secure. Uh, it, by the way, it makes superluminal communication by using entangled states is impossible. So basically remember, superluminal not possible, and it's actually one of the consequences of this theorem. Well, the last one, quantum teleportation, seems to be also impossible. That's an interesting conclusion. I'm not going to talk about this more, but if you're interested, you get curious, you can learn more about these things what the quantum teleportation is about and how it relates to the no quantum theorem and why the modern quantum teleportation results are really not real quantum teleportation. This teleportation only 25% of the information. Okay. But even uh, if you do the uh, better than 25%, if you go to try to use the maximum theoretically possible teleportation, you will arrive at the limit of so-called quantum cloning, which is 75%. So basically the no cloning theorem does not allow you, people call it quantum cloning, but it's a cloning with fidelity of 75%. So the question is, like, if 75% is right here, then we are going to be teleported without the top. <laughs> So that's a very interesting question. Anyway, so what is no cloning? Uh, there are lots of different definitions of that and derivations of that, but the most simple one, basically, if you have two states, A and B, 
So basically, and uh, you act on them with the operator U, then uh, if if it's a regular uh, kind of unitary operator, then uh, the final state, time final states, it would be a product of initial states. If by any chance your operator is such that it creates two states instead of one, plus let's imagine you go from the opposite. Let's say uh, copying is possible. So basically the action of this state is instead of one, make it two. One and second is a clock of that. So then when you multiply them, you will have the it will be B A squared. So this one and this one. But in quantum mechanics, it's the same state. So this should be equal to that. And then that's really like you ask yourself when this is possible. And this is possible only when they are either equal to each other or they are zero. Well, that's basically what the, the, the proof. It's, it's mathematical. I'll, I'll tell you the physical uh, explanation. My personal physical understanding of no Floyd theorem uh, in a minute. So, uh, and superposition principle, so also with states, horizontal vertical states of photons, it's also the same thing. Uh, if you have H goes to HH, H, V goes to VB, then if you have H plus V, it has to go to this, but it's not like this times that. So the it's not a two final states, it's different. So you cannot make this out of that. That's another way of explaining it. Well, now we're coming to polarization, photons, and mutually unbiased basis. Mutually unbiased basis is 0, 90, and 45, 135, basically. So orthogonal and diagonal. Why they are mutually unbiased? Because every vector from one state, if you try to project it on the other one, it will give you superposition, but it will be equal superposition. So basically, uh, 90 to 35 will give you plus minus square root of 2, basically. Uh, and vice versa. So basically, they are equal projections on the other one. That's why they call them mutually unbiased. Uh, what, why this is important here? Because uh, polarization works by projection. So if you have polarization state and you would like to measure it, how you measure polarization? You take analyzer, polarization analyzer, and you project your state on the state of the analyzer. And what the analyzer does, it either allows you to go through or not. If, it's, uh, if the state of analyzer coincides with the state of your photon, it's 100% tax. When it's like 50% like this, then it's a 50% tax. Right? So what does it mean, pass? Uh, pass, it means uh, you can put your detector and detect this event. So, uh, and then, based on this detection, you, may, you make a conclusion of what was coming. So if you have a vertical photon coming and your polarizer is vertical and you have a detector, so 100% pass, 100% every detection you have tells you the truth that it was the photon at this orientation, right? But if my photon counts at 45 degrees, I still use the same analyzer and detector, then 50% of time uh, I will have some clicks, but it will be wrong. Because this 50% of time, uh, the 45 degrees can generate clicks for 50% of time. But it, the conclusion, I would think that it's, it was vertical, but in reality it was 45. So that's a source of error when you do that, uh, use mutual and biased basis. Now, physical explanation of no cloning, like how you could resolve that parallel, this thing. So basically, you, if you take and go to the level of single photons, and if you encode your polarization state in these two bases, but on every single photon, remember, to detect the photon is actually one of the major, major problems, feature and the problem of uh, photonic quantum optics. You want to get information about the photon, you have to kill it. You absorb it, you kill it. There is no second one, basically. With the particle, 
If the particle has a spin, you measure the spin, you disturb your particle, but it's still there and it still has a spin. Disturb what spin is there. You can reuse it for some purpose. With photons, it's gone. So that's really the physical essence here. So you, uh, you have single photon and you encode it either in one basis or in the other basis. So it's a two-fold ambiguity. There's one and another. So two options you can have for one single photon. But when you detect this photon, you kill it. So there is not enough energy to resolve the two-fold ambiguity with one quantum of energy. So that's a physical kind of uh, description of uh, why quantum photography is secure and why you cannot flow. If you would have two photons, then you can do that. You do two measurements. And then you can conclude was it true or not, because you can do two measurements. You can make first measurement in this base, second measurement in that base, and see which one is happening more frequently. So that one will be a real state of the photon that is coming in, so you can identify. But with one photon and one single measurement, you always will have 50% chance of error. That's basically the bottom line. Well, and also, it's why all, I will talk about this, all Im practical implementations of quantum cryptography always require a very nice, clean, single photon state. The minute, instead of single photons, you will have double photons in the pulse, you are vulnerable to the uh, resolution of this paradox, and then your cryptography will be not secure anymore. Okay, so that's the role of photons and polarizations. So basically, the protocol is very simple. Well, first, let's talk about the single photon quantum cryptography. Bennett Brassard 84, uh, quantum key distribution, classical encryption, uh, uses basically is based on distribute random key and then do the one-time path. Basically, that's what it says here. So quantum key distribution and then one-time path. That's what the secure communication is about. Uh, well, uh, now we have to establish the key of what the procedure. The procedure is, the first thing, uh, we set up the base, so vertical uh, is uh, 90, uh, 90 degrees and uh, 135 will be 1 and 0, 45 will be 0. And then Alice sends photons uh, and uh, what it do she does, she randomly switches the base in which it sends photons, but also in addition to changing the base, she selects one of the polarizations. So re remember, there are two things, base and which particular polarization in this base has been used. Two, uh, two types of um, uh, information, and they are randomly modulated. So you randomly select which base you use, and randomly select which polarization inside that base you use. And then you use this map to say, OK, that's what basically Alice is trying to say, send in terms of the logical bits. They are encoded in these polarizations. Now, what Bob is doing, Bob is coming with the analyzer, polarization analyzer, and has two choices. You put it this way or that way, and then detect it behind to measure what came through. So uh, that's what Bob does, and that's what Bob detects. OK, uh, but Bob, again, randomly chooses the measurement base. So you can already see, so 50% of time, Bob will pick up the wrong base, because it's random. Right? So uh, and what is red here is when uh, Alice selected one base, that, but, but Bob selected the other one. Well. Uh, how to deal with that. What Alice and Bob do, they take the public communication line and reveal the basis. Revealing basis doesn't reveal the whole information because you do not reveal which state inside the base you use. You just reveal which basis you are using. And Bob compares which, with what uh, he was using and obviously 50% time it's wrong so he just drops those. So immediately you have 50% overhead on the communication. So 50% of your information immediately waste, goes to waste. 
so uh, after that, after that, uh, they now uh, they know that they did the measurements in the same basis. Okay, and now they have to figure out uh, whether there was any problem in communication. Are there any errors in communication? How you do that? What you do, you take these uh, recorded strings and uh, you subselect randomly small portion of that, I don't know, maybe like 5-10%, but randomly, through whole uh, sequence, and you reveal it. Again, through the public channel, Alice and Bob compare what, uh, like on this bit, this, 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 um, uh, they check results for some of the cases, as again, randomly select. Uh, of course, it's now waste, because they publicly announced that, but it's not so, so large percentage, but it allows them to evaluate how many errors they encountered. So if they all coincide, perfect, it's 100%, no errors. But it's very rare. <laughs> Actually, it's never happened. So then, let's say you have errors. What, how many? What is the percentage of errors? And uh, that's an uh, interesting issue because, uh, well, if the communication line is long, it can disturb the photon parameters, polarization, and everything. By itself, it will introduce errors. Uh, but then there is the problem of the eavesdropper. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about. So uh, after they uh, communicate this, uh, and uh, now they have finally the secret key known to Alice Wolf, and they know with what error this key is obtained. So that's the first stage of the, of the evaluation. Well, again, so. Uh, the there are two. Let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll come back to this. In, in, so if if when it comes to the line, we'll do exactly the same what Bob is doing, right? Because it's a single photon going through the line. Your job is to pick up the single photon, try to guess correctly the state of this photon, make a copy of this clone and send it back to Bob, right? Then, if everything works well, then Bob will still do what he has to do, but you have a copy of that, and when it comes to the end, you will have a copy of the information, because you can monitor all the public information between Alice and Bob, and then you have everything for the future use. So, Alice, for sorry, Eve does the same, takes the this measure, but again, the same as Bob, if will make 50% error in uh, evaluating what polarization is. But then, uh, th this error will go propagate towards Bob, because the copy will be made and sent to the Bob. And then Bob will do his own and takes another 50% error on what it will send there. So it's like 0.5 times 0.5 becomes 0.25. That's where this 25% margin of security comes about, basically. So, they, as I said, so the uh, Eve can get up to three quarters, 75 percent, but 25 percent will still be the error. And this is really the indicator for the legitimate users that someone is listening on the line. How you reveal it? Exactly from this stage that we just discussed right here. If you uh, start doing the uh, you start comparing those results and suddenly you find that you have more than 25% errors by randomly checking the things. It's an indicator someone is listening on the line. What you can do? Just drop the line. That's, that's what it is. Go to another one, check that one. If that one will come not with 25 but for example with 10% or 11% or 5% error, which means, okay, that's uh, no eavesdropper, but there is some noisy propagation and whatever in communication. So, uh, and uh, basically, if I, go, if I have, for example, 10% error, oh, it's a substantial error, right? So you don't want to use this uh, for encoding, because so if no one was listening, but 
the, 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 the Alice's and Bob's strays are, have 10% errors between them. Uh, you, you would like to have as close to 100% as possible because then it becomes clean communication. So how, what do you do with this? In principle, you can improve the quality of this render of this, uh, no, sorry, of um, equal, uh, to make them equal, uh, those strains. Uh, so it's uh, called the privacy amplification uh, protocol. Uh, how you do that, uh, you, uh, well, the best one is to test the parity. Uh, you know, it's a very standard procedure everywhere, like even in randomization. So you have a string of numbers. What you do, you chop it in blocks, like let's say eight bits, for example. And then you check the parity of this block. So because they are 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, it's either even or odd. You add them, you sum them up, and you come up with the number. If it's odd number, you say, OK, this block has odd number, next one, or even, or whatever. So, and Alice and Bob do the same. And then they publicly compare uh, the are they same or different parity. Because you don't reveal the information. You reveal only some of those things. And if, for example, your block, Alice's block and Bob's block have the same parity, you say, check, it's good. They are exactly the same. When parity is different, what do you do? Drop it. Same, keep it. Drop. So at the end of the, after that, you lose part of the stream, but you, what remains has much higher degree of fidelity uh, and uh, lower error. So it's a standard process in nature. So you throw away something, but you boost performance of something else. Uh, yes. Uh, yesterday you talked about entropy, not in physics, but in probability. Uh, I want to ask that, why don't we use polarization or filtering uh, to get higher level of percentage in entropy and make the communication better? No, but that's what we use. We use polarization here. Yes, but uh, we always get the uh, 50 percentage. Uh, yeah. Why can't we make it better or? How we can make better? You need to prevent Eve from getting information. The best way to prevent from getting information, make equal probability of having right and wrong. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the principle. If you change this ratio from 50-50 to 70 to 30, you will have biased situation. So Eve can gain more information. But isn't it uh, a better way to make a good communication? What do you mean? What's what the better way? The better way, we, we're not making not communication, we're making security. Security means mm -hmm. lack of information obtained by the third party. Okay. The lack of information, the best way to, obtain, to have a lack of information obtained by the other party to make things random, right? Yes. So randomness is the limit. You can it's, express it in, in values. It's 50-50 percent always, right? Yeah. OK. And that means you have zero information. Yes. And that's a purpose. Security. I know you would not know, because you have 50-50 percent chance of making error. That's the principle of secure communication, using quantum. OK, uh, I saw there was another question. OK. Uh, all right, so basically, you can increase the fidelity and decrease the, uh, uh, decrease the, here, uh, the rate. Uh, but basically, you trade the quantity for the quality. So at the end of the day, uh, the other interesting thing is um, uh, everyone would need to do that because, well, there is some agreement at which level you can use secure communication. So you have to bring it like to 99%, for example, which means you have to do this procedure uh, of private simplification using the parity, so lose something. So if you go back and ask yourself, oh, how much I have to lose out of those bits? 
to get to 99%. So then you, uh, because you start from some error, like from 10% error, or from 15% error. The more error you start with, the more you have to do this procedure, and the more you lose the real key rate numbers. So basically, uh, what, like out of everything, uh, there are some theories, estimates, basically. The idea is your communication line should not introduce more than like 7-10% um, of errors. If you have uh, just Alice Bob do this and they come up with like 15% uh, of errors, to get it back to 99%, you will not have enough keys to process it because you will keep improving, 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 and your line of keys shrinking, 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 and you don't have enough room. So basically, you really have to clean up your communication line, make sure, uh, we already know, because it's less than 25%, there is no eavesdropper. All the errors are due to the quality of the communication line. And communication, if we're talking about polarization, for example, you take polarization photons, send it through the fiber. I don't know how many of you have experience with that, but you know this. What comes out on the other side of the fiber can be pretty much not exactly the same polarization. There are lots of efforts needs to be put into the stabilization. OK, yeah, that's what I told you uh, yesterday. So about the, oops, sorry. How to do this with polarization. You just encoded light uh, single photons in uh, horizontal vertical of 45 minus 45 and that's what it is and if does the same and gets the five percent of it. Okay, <coughs> where are we Well now uh, there was a single photon communication. So you take a single photon source, send it through the modulator to the Bob, Bob demodulates, if also sometimes demodulates, and it's a single photon uh, the, the single photon and double encoding in mutually unbiased basis tells you, gives you a reason to reveal the eavesdropper and that's what um, kind of uh, shows you the quantum nature of security. It's in the single photon and double ambiguity in the mutually unbiased space. Okay, there is another approach to quantum uh, cryptography. It's based on entangled states, accurate 91 protocol. So, uh, it's uh, based on the source of entangled states. One photon goes here, one goes there. Uh, if you create this entangled state and do the Bell's inequality measurement, we discussed this yesterday. So, you have, uh, as you remember, what we have. We have violations of Bell's inequality in these areas around uh, the 22.5 and 67.5. Uh, sorry, this, this one, yeah, 67.5 uh, angles. Uh, so this is the quantum margin. This is classical. So basically, <coughs> it's based on the fact that if uh, I send these uh, two photons, uh, to one side and the other side, if I do the Bell's inequality test, if no one is on the line doing anything to my photons, well, except that the communication line is going to spoil them a, a little bit, and I told you that in quantum mechanics it's very important the properties of the source, properties of propagation, and properties of detection, quality of that, for the final result of the measurement. So if everything is fine, I will see this. Okay? Now, if the eavesdropper will come in the line, in either one side or another, and will try to do the same thing, then make a copy and resend it back, this would go, will be limited by the classical domain only. Because measuring, as I told you, measuring the quantum state will bring you into the classical domain. Then you make a copy of that, you send it back, and basically you already operate only in the classical domain after that. So you not be able to do the violation of bells and equality. So it's a different physical reason to break 
the quantumness of the state. Uh, it's uh, based on the fact that you create the state, but you cannot clone the state. No cloning means you can make a classical copy and then reintroduce it and do the same measurement again and get the quantum result from the whole thing. So you basically break your, the if appears either here or there, it breaks the quantumness of the system. So you are in the classical domain after that. So if you, after that it will be purely classical, so you cannot demonstrate violation of those and the And again, uh, here is, uh, this is the margin of the eavesdropper detection. And if you look carefully, it's about the same 25%. Uh, similar to the previous one. So uh, if you do everything and uh, how you detect it, you do, do the same thing. You do the detection at different angles. Uh, you can select even the same uh, parameters. Um, well, except that to, to stay at the maximal uh, violation of Bell's inequality, instead of 45 minus 45, you have to use uh, 22.5 and 67.5. Uh, degrees, and uh, that's how, how you do it. It's called the ACAT protocol, and the uh, result is the same. While uh, the quantumness, uh, uh, the, uh, the quantumness of the state uh, <coughs> ensures that whenever you do something classical to this state, you, your result will be distinguishable within 25% from what quantum mechanics predict. In both trees. Well, to some extent, you can really draw the analogy between these two. So, because it looks like the purpose is the same and the tools are quantum of photonics, right? It should be similar. What the similarity is about? Okay, in principle, what we can do, we can take this entangled source and move it here to Alice, basically, and then it becomes almost the same apparatus as before. Uh, and then you can ask yourself, okay, there are two types of technology. The first one is based on the uh, entanglement. Remember what the entanglement is about? Correlation and superposition. Correlation and superposition. Okay, what is the two bases that mutual unbiased, the two correlation with mutual unbiased bases? They give you superposition, right? One projection of one on the other one is a superposition of two. So superposition is there. We need correlation. So in uh, when you use entangled sources, the correlation and superposition is already embedded in the source. In BB84, you start with single photon. So you do superposition. Where is the correlation? Remember the portion of the communication when you publicly tell what base you are using. So this is the analog of correlation uh, between outcomes. Uh, it's, it's kind of like semi-classical correlation, but uh, you can draw the analogy between these two technologies based on that. Uh, and uh, well, the entangled source is uh, kind of slightly harder to operate than just a single photon source and modulator because single photon source is just a laser, you attenuate it and that's just attenuated laser. You just have to attenuate it uh, enough so per each pulse of the laser, remember you need to have one photon. But laser itself, it's a coherent state. Coherent state statistics is Poisson. So you have a pulse and you have a Poisson. Poisson, if you remember, it has a probability of having zero photons, one photon, two, three, and so on. Uh, in our case, we want to have one, but we don't want to have two. Well, when you have a Poisson, you no way you can avoid this. The only thing you can do, you can minimize the amount of two versus the amount of one. How you do that? You have to make sure that average number of photons per pulse is substantially smaller than one. And lots of calculations and uh, theories tells you like around 0.2, 0 0.2 photons per pulse. That's where the number of single photons is uh, like nine, ten times bigger than the amount of uh, double photons. So you have to watch for the intensity. Uh, yeah. I think I something. This you add the second source here. 
No, it's, it's just it's it's uh, like if this one moves in there. No, it's it's like uh, you you move it right here. So when this one here, this one is not. So it's just a, you see, it's indistinguishable from a single photon source. So a qubit is coded in the A basis and holds the big value uh, given the analysis result. So you basically either can have source in the middle, or you can move the source to the analysis side. Yeah, it's 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 basically the same. Thing. Uh, the one interesting thing here is, uh, remember the quantum mechanics is the linear theory. Yeah. Linearity is a powerful tool, basically, whether it's here or here from the linear theory, it's the yeah, same thing. The yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so, actually, yeah, okay. So, uh, well, uh, the quantum cryptography has been done many times in many different areas. So, for example, here uh, it's between two mountains uh, in, in Alps uh, using polarization encoding in free space over 23 kilometers. Uh, actually, the free space happens to be better for polarization encoding than fiber here. It holds polarization better. Um, uh, to, well, uh, you need to encode in different polarization bases. Original, the first experiments were done with like basically one laser and then polarizer, a pocket cell basically that rotates polarized polarization. But pocket cells, uh, it's a uh, nonlinear crystal, basically a piezoelectric crystal that you have to apply like 1.5 kilovolts to change the polarization and so on. And uh, it's only a particular frequency you can reach with that because switching 1.5 kilovolts with nanosecond time again generate lots of colors. You can do that. Uh, like 30 kilohertz was the maximum rate you can start with. It was not good, you need more. So what people did, they say, okay, let's take the different approach. We have four lasers, same intensity, but we put different four polarizers and we merge them of, in a passive way on Wilsfrieder. So now, if each laser operates at pretty low intensity, then uh, if the overall intensity is still low, but you don't know from which laser the next photon is coming. So it's a random encoding of in four polarization states. It goes here, and then this is the detector. The detector is again passive, uh, 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 the passive analysis. So here it's a non-polarizing beam splitter divided in two, but then this is polarizing beam splitter, one polarization. So basically this would be like uh, 0, 90, this one 45, minus 45. Well, uh, the only thing here, it's, it's stable because there's no active elements, it's passive, but you lose 50% here because if you are polarizing 45, but you go in this direction, then it's a wrong thing, so it, it will give you the error. So 50% uh, gives you errors, but uh, then you buy the very stable apparatus that doesn't require any modulation. And uh, the rate is only defined by how the lasers and how fast your detector can resolve the uh, photons. Remember the quantum state has to be created in such a way that it will be one quantum state at a time, then propagation should not distort the states uh, to mix the neighbors, and then your detector should be fast enough again to distinguish each separate state arriving to these detectors. If your detectors are too slow, you have to reduce the flux because uh, then you will have pile up of pulses on the detector too two states will be coming to the detector and it will not be able to distinguish that. It's uh, average. It's already a semi-classical state. Uh, phase encoding. Well, phase is the same thing. You can uh, do the, instead of polarization, there is a big analogy between polarization and just regular dynamic phase. So basically polarization has uh, 360 degrees and regular dynamic phase has two sides. 360 degrees. You can do the same thing. This is like a big interferometer, but 
Uh, there are two arms here. It's not good. So you, between Alice and Bob, you need two lines. So how about uh, do something like this? We have one interferometer here, one line, one interferometer here. And that's a very interesting situation because in principle, when you start detecting this, uh, there are more than, uh, there are four options. Because it looks like uh, you take a single photon pulse, you send it here, uh, and uh, uh, it can go either through the short, long or through the short path. And here it can also be a combination of long short. And if you ask yourself, uh, it, it, there are four combinations. They say, like, remember, the beer scale gives you four combinations as well. So your detector will detect uh, this is short short, long long, but this one will be short long or long short, and they will be the same. Okay? And uh, that's where the interference comes, because interference it's, uh, needs superposition and indistinguishability. Only these two are indistinguishable. These are distinguishable. So what to do? If you detect them all, you have classical situation, four options, like we discussed, so it's not entangled. But uh, if you put a window here, and only detect events within this window and just ignore those. Remember the operation of entanglement. So you filter out something and it looks like entanglement. So the same thing is here. So if you don't detect, and this is what you, it's your detection apparatus, it's up to you to register this or not to register it, or only concentrate on this central peak, and that's how it works basically. You, the only uh, potential problem is you need to stabilize the path difference. So this interferometer should be exactly the same as this within very high uh, accuracy. Uh, but it has big advantage. What is the advantage of this? To have good interference, you need to have long coherence length. Long coherence length means the narrow spectral bandwidth. And narrow spectral bandwidth is very good for fiber communications. Because when the bandwidth is narrow, there's no dispersion. Remember, dispersion is different speed of different frequencies. And when all frequencies are the same, they all have the same frequency. So that's really, it's, it's our, it was one of our discoveries when we tried to do practical QKD in telecommunication fibers. And, uh, well, uh, then uh, there was another interesting development, and uh, thanks to our uh, Nicolas Duzan at the University of Geneva, they came up with very, very interesting uh, solution of the problem um, of the, like, if you go from Alice to Bob over a lengthy fiber, you pick up lots of different uh, modulations. Uh, fibers can be either twisted a little bit, or it could be t different temperature, different tensions, and so on. All of this will give you phase changes of the light going through. Yes? Can you use polarization and, can we use polarization and phase same time? Uh, they are indistinguishable. Uh, it's a separate topic, but uh, they're basically indistinguishable in terms of their effect. You, you can. But you cannot distinguish that, and you don't. It, it gives you extra problem and ambiguity. So, uh, so this one is um, uh, basically uh, it's called. They call it plug and play configuration. What does it mean? You need to have single photon goes from Alice to Bob and encode it there. What they did it was very smart. They stuck with Alice, and uh, they send uh, through the interferometer. Uh, but very strong pulse, not single photon, strong pulse. Strong pulse applied to the ball. But while going through the fiber, the strong pulse applied picks up all the modulations on the way. But then Bob attenuates this to the single photon level and modulates and send back. So when you attenuate all of them, because each photon basically in this package, of intense package, has the same information, carries the same information about phase modulations, disturbances on the fiber, they send it back 
but sent back from the phase um, conjugate mirror. Basically, you just reverse the phase and uh, send it back, and uh, what happens is you automatically undo all the phase modulation. So when it comes to Alice, Alice does the job of original ball, and uh, the protocol works the same, but now because of this double pass, first intense pulse and then real weak pulse, uh, because when you send intense pulse, you do not affect the distance. The distance is defined by the single photon, how long the single photon can go through. And uh, really, it improves the stability, quality, and everything, because this pulse compensates for all the imperfectness of the communication line. And it was so good that they, basically they can take it any fiber you want, connect it, and uh, just this self-correction of the parameters of the fiber made it really plug and play uh, option. Uh, by the way, just pay attention to the dates on all those uh, results and compare with what you hear today about things. All right, uh, this is what I've shown you uh, in Boston when we did this uh, DARPA quantum network uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, exactly, we selected first uh, fibers and uh, we did the phase uh, modulation, but uh, in principle we had two options, basically. We, this was the phase modulated line with weak coherent, but then we had the entangled, but we did this with free space, because free space is better suited for the polarization. Uh, people did the polarization encoding in fibers, but they have to lay down a uh, specialty fibers. They call the polarization preserving fibers. Because if you have a regular fiber, uh, circular single mode fiber, you send polarization and it will just go around. Because whenever fiber bends, you will create internal bioinfringence and it will immediately turn your polarization. And, uh, or your fiber go, and then there's some kind of train or heavy truck goes by the road. You know, they usually put fibers either along the rail tracks or along the roads. And that uh, affects the quality of the communication. So it's, it's basically, here is straightforward source, modulation, channel, demodulation, and detectors. Here is... Uh, uh, source on the crystal, one photon stays with uh, Alice and second one goes to the Bob. Uh, although it's called the Alex and Barb uh, because there were several channels. Alex Bob was the main channel, this is the second channel, A and B. Um, the idea is, uh, well then uh, when you do that, the distant, you know, single photons are photons, they get an absor absorption, it's universal property, it's always there. And um, uh, the <sighs> you can create so many quantum states in the beginning. And then you start propagate them in the fiber or in the free space. You always have to know how much will reach to detect. The closer you come, the more of them. The farther away, the less we discussed it yesterday. So you move it to 500 kilometers, you get almost nothing there. So, but even in the communication, when you do this inside the city, in metropolitan network, over like 10, 20, 30 kilometers, uh, you do it, well, we can have maybe uh, 50, maybe 100 kilohertz, 50,000 or 100,000 events per second. And if you compare that with the traditional internet speed, then it's way, way, way below, right? So uh, the question is how to uh, combine the speed of the regular internet communication. This is the IPsec, uh, one of the protocols, security protocols on the internet. And with the physical layer right here, this is our physical layer. So we run this uh, physical layer right here. Uh, we get uh, bits. Then we put them, you see, like we deposit them in these buckets. And this machinery of quantum key distribution does all the sifting, cleaning, distillation, and privacy amplification. 
So a um, really, really nice clean sequence of bits deposited here, and it's available for the telecommunication encoded, but the rate of arrival of these bits is multiple orders of magnitude lower than there. So the question is how to deal with that, how we can, uh, at that time where it was really serious, how to uh, kind of uh, sell this to industry basically. And uh, what we tried to do, we said, okay, if, if you do the regular browsing on the internet here, maybe you don't need such a high security. But when you try to make a payment for something, you would really like to have high level of security, then maybe to encode your credit card number uh, and uh, with the security code, you may would like to use the most secure kind of block of communication, very well protected, not regular key, but the quantum key for securing this one. Then it becomes more or less uh, doable and uh, useful because uh, the amount of bits to encode this really sensitive information that you'd like to protect is not so large in this situation. Again, it's for the kind of general internet use of secure communication. Of course, military people, they say, we're all secure, whatever we say is secure, we should be secure, and even their boring meetings are also secure, so they want to dig a bit of uh, secure keys. <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's just uh, the, the, like uh, what do we need to match the entangled photon links with the uh, real telecommunication equipment? It's just a kind of block diagram showing you when you go deeper and deeper the, in technology, things are really getting involved in there. Well, uh, as uh, I said, like at that time, of course, uh, since technology was developing, there were uh, Startups, people try to make business out of that, right? So to make secure solution, and there were a few of them. One of them was Magic U Technology uh, in Boston. Uh, yeah, they asked me to set up their labs uh, in Boston, and uh, this is the boxes basically that you can connect. One it goes to Alice, one goes to Bob, and you can do this uh, secure communications. Uh, this is the ID Quantique, also one of the earlier players in this business. They use their boxes. Uh, this is Alice Bob used their plug and play system that was working nice. Uh, this all information is about let me see what else. I think there were some Japanese systems also uh, for this. Um, and uh, but the interesting thing is, it's just 20 years old. And now you hear we have quantum cryptography, quantum communication stuff out here, quantum com there, 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 everywhere. And uh, is it good or bad? It's very interesting. <coughs> First question. The quantum cryptography is so great, why those first guys didn't make a billion dollar business on that? If you ask yourself what they're doing right now, they're actually there, the Sky D Quantique and Magic Q, it's a few of those that survived, they're still alive. But they're basically doing something else now. They still can sell those boxes, but only like one, two, three per year, that's it. It's not a business. Market is low. And, uh, uh, if you try to do the business about this, you have to know how to do business. So, so at that time, we tried to set up a uh, startup on different type of things, but we learned lessons how to do that. So if you go to raise money from the venture capitalists uh, for your company, we you know what first question they ask you. What's the speed? No. What is the closest? Well, relatively, what is the market? The market size. They're not really, then, second question would be, uh, what kind of team do you have for your company? And only third question would be, what technology you are using for that? Okay? Market. Because that's the size of the, how much you can sell 
That's what, how profitable your company will be in the future. That's the reason why everywhere in the world people are trying to erase trade borders, right? All the trade agreements between countries like European Union, uh, North American uh, trade agreement with Canada and Mexico and all others. Whenever you hear about them, it's an attempt to make sure that the company inside each country can sell to everyone without constraints as much as possible, the market. Well, how about form of security? Why it's not selling to, why those companies making those nice boxes, they couldn't sell to everyone. At some point, which has also been a long time ago, so I, I was helping the Italians to build up their own first common cryptography system. And that's where it occurred to me, this, uh, where I realized this. And I realized it on a small event. Uh, we've been, we have a project for about already three years. We had some system to demo. And then military people from Italian government who gave money for that, they were the same as in the US or uh, DARPA was given, but we were doing public kind of research on that. Uh, so they came in and they asked me to leave the room. Because, uh, okay. yeah, I built it up, all, all the things. Okay, we'll be discussing it, but you have to go. You are foreign. In Italy. So uh, that's how I realized that the cryptography is a security solution is a completely different type of commodities than anything else in this world. It has natural borders, trade borders. No one would buy a security solution from across the border. So basically, if you want to make a business on security, well, be careful, because uh, you have to file, figure out how many of these systems you will be able to sell. So that's an... Uh, uh, I hope uh, all these dozens of uh, new startups that I have seen in Munich three weeks ago, it was a laser show and, of, and the uh, Clio Europe laser conference uh, with lots of lots of quantum, 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 quantum everywhere. So hopefully they will realize it sometime. But at the moment, well, they're raising money, they go and burning through this money, they're learning. They're educating students, there are lots of postdocs become going from instead of academia into the companies and so on. It's a good process, but uh, at the end you have to know what, what will be there. So you have to do the uh, educated conclusions or educated prediction for that. Okay, so uh, again, uh, this is the distance. <laughs> this is secure secret bit rate for a part. Or per pulse or whatever per second. You can do it per pulse or per second, it doesn't matter. It's a rate of secure bits and this is the distance. And basically uh, it's uh, detector noise limits, uh, then this is the optical noise. Uh, this is the limitation if you cannot do the single photon and multi photons in per pulse start to come or the EVE comes in, so that's where the limitations in the distance of secure communications. If there is no EVE and there is no multi-photon pulses, then you can go to here, and uh, then if you reduce optical noise in the system, you can go there. If you reduce the depth of noise, you can really move it maybe right there. And that's exactly what happens today, and the people trying to push this as much as possible. I told you it was like 500 kilometers, but the rate is somewhere right here. Like if this is 10 to the minus 6, it's really like right there. So you're 10 to the minus 6, it's per pulse. If you do a million shots per second, 1 megahertz, then it would be 1 per second, basically. Then it would be 1. But then I told you it's 0.01 per second, it will be like right here. So people reduce optical noise, reduce detector noise, and reach that point. But again, the uh, question is how much is much uh, in terms of the coverage. And the only way to increase the coverage, as I mentioned yesterday, is to uh, link your regular communication fiber network with the satellites. <coughs> 
And uh, basically, you do the kind of Alice sends this to the satellite, and then satellite drops it to Bob, to another Bob, whatever. So covering uh, at different places. Uh, well, as I told you, it's good. Everything is good. The distances can be covered, but the weather conditions are important. Should we kind of keep fibers? Uh, well, that's a good question. Do, yeah, I, I, I've shown you this uh, Chinese uh, communication using satellites, but by the way, uh, Chinese have also the uh, communication line from the Beijing to Shanghai in 32 nodes. Basically, remember, though, this is quantum, no repeaters, no amplifiers. So it's from point to point, point to point. To point. But at each point, at every computer, you have to have a military guard standing there. And that's what they do. They have lots of people there, so they, 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 they have communicate, well, secure communication uh, in fibers from Beijing to Shanghai with like 32 nodes and 32 computers guarded. Uh, so to make sure that security is good. Why did you to go ten terabyte hard drives? Huh? Why they don't to go 10 terabyte, 10 terabyte hard drives, as you said, between two Well, you can, you can tell them that. Anyways, <laughs> 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 and see what happens. <laughs> anyway, just to tell you that, uh, and of course, all this happens after 2013 when Chinese. Uh, decided to launch their satellite and put billions of dollars in that. that was very lots of, uh, so if Chinese is doing this, we also have to do that. You know, like, uh, lots of money is flying in this area, and uh, some people are successful in grabbing this money and using this. Uh, but just to tell you that uh, the, um, uh, this issue has been uh, the balance and all the pros and cons have been investigated by the, my colleagues at Los Alamos. Well, uh, back in 2002, those colleagues are long retired now. <laughs> so, but they knew everything about that. Uh, it's just an example. But there was well, like public lectures. They've shown the balance of the, the uh, balance sheet of uh, all the kind of how much, how frequently you can send, kind of receive. Uh, but the problem, the problem is the satellites are moving. So first, you have to find the just catch the satellite shows up. Establish the link, it takes some time, right? Regular kind of arranging to the satellites to find, okay, lock it. And then uh, get the exchange of the data, and then that's it. The whole thing is about like 20 minutes. <laughs> so you use a few minutes in the beginning, you use a few minutes for the, uh, at the end, on the sunny day, on the clean day. <laughs> if you have a cloud, Forget it, but it's gone, basically. So, uh, lots of interesting details if you go inside that. At the superficial level, it sounds great. That's exactly what you hear today everywhere in the news. But uh, when you start to dig into the real technology the implementation, you have to fight mother nature that uh, is classical. It doesn't like quantum very much. And uh, it's a general rule for quantum. It always wor works somewhere. You have to find some niche where it can work. Because you have to avoid the impact of our classical world on the quantum environment and destroying this environment. And the clouds is one of them, basically. <laughs> because if you have, well, actually, the clouds are so bad even for classical laser. You know, all these uh, programs of the uh, powerful lasers on the, either on the ground or on the airplane to shoot missiles. Uh, they've been around for 20 years now, and have you seen any successes? You've heard that there are successes, basically. <laughs> but the problem is how to deliver high power to the point in the atmosphere, where atmosphere is classical environment of turbulence, uh, uh, clouds, and everything, everything, everything. It's, it's a big interesting problem if you start to look into details of that. The same is here, except that we don't have megawatts of lasers. Uh, we really have single photons going inside there. All right, so, and again, uh, if you learn, want to learn about basics of photography from uh, 
the first way for people who did that, you can uh, check this book. And thank you for your attention.